Um, I need to send him the Zoom info. I don't think I sent it to him yet. Um, text with him right now.
Adam, good to see you. How are you, Rabbi? I'm doing great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, go off the, the conversation because I'm still prepared with a couple of things, but I'm so happy to see you. Thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure, Rabbi. And I, I used to train with Tyler myself. My audio is off. Thank you. 
Adam. Rabbi Adam, baby. baby, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Awesome. I, think I had a little bit of, uh, just had to unplug the headphones and everything. Yes. There's always technical challenges with this stuff, or we got to get ready to. Maybe it's too many Lachaims. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's on my side. Probably is. Yeah. I'm doing Lachaims on. Race, how are you? Um, some seltzer. Yeah. The hard stuff. Exactly. Sweet and steady. So, seltzer? What? What? No Dr. Pepper? Mm. Good question. Yeah. When yep. we have cold melter, seltzer around the house, I drink cold seltzer. Cold, cold, cold melter. Larry Melzer. <laughs> I got it. I, I got you. I got you. I caught that one. Yeah. Good on, Tyler. Okay. Freudian slip. Okay. We're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, hey, Tyler. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. You too. I, we're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes. Sounds good. Tyler, you've been in Jackson for a while, right? You used to train with Shane and um, Chris yep. Butler, right? Yep, yep. I think we trained together. Yep, yep. What's going on, man? How are you? Good, good. You? Long time. Pretty good. Where are you at now? Down we in getting, Florida. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. COVID ground zero. Lucky me. <laughs> we are getting started on Facebook. T-Y. L-E-R. All right. I'm going to mute myself. Thank Good you, chatting Adam. To me real quick. We're going to go live on Facebook just to make sure that it's there for posterity, that anyone else who wants to see this presentation can do that either live now with us or later as well if you are on facebook at this moment and you can see me um please comment like let us know where you're tuning in from so we're sure that all of this is working out just fine and we have no technical difficulties we're going to give it a couple of minutes uh, or one minute just to be sure that Someone who's on Facebook could read, could see what's going on. If you are on Facebook right now, please comment, like, or generally let us know that you are on so we can get started. We're waiting to have someone on Facebook confirm that this is live and working just fine. Facebook, Facebook, are you there? Are you there? Can you hear me? <laughs> Um, okay. How do we get this to raise? No. Why is that our screen? Um. But I think Spotlight is just for us. Just one moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so very much for joining us. We're going to be starting in just one moment. Are we all good? I think so. But I think he's just passed the screen. Hello and welcome each and every one of you for joining us for today's Zoom presentation with Razy and my kickboxing coach, Tyler Davis. This evening is titled, Keeping Fit and Healthy at Home. My name is Rabbi Zalman Mendelssohn and I have the unique pleasure of serving as the co-director of the Chabad Jewish Center of Wyoming together with my dear wife, Razy. It is wonderful to see familiar faces and new faces. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Our mission at the Chabad Jewish Center 
is to bring people together for all kinds of causes, primarily to share the wisdom, the thoughts, the deep ideas of Jewish love, Jewish values, Jewish tradition, Jewish culture, but also during this time to bring people together just because we're sick and tired of being alone by ourselves. Our mission is thankfully been going strong on a consistent basis, and we've had the pleasure of hosting so many of these wonderful events, and it's always wonderful to have you with us. A few housekeeping items before we begin our fun evening. We're gonna keep this simple and straightforward. First, I would like to share with you an upcoming event. Please mark your calendars, there are two of them. On Tuesday, July 21st at 7.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, we are going to be hosting an event titled Breathing Techniques and Maintaining Equilibrium with yoga instructor and business owner Adi Amar. Please join us for that. I think you'll find it interesting. On Tuesday, July 28th at 7.30 p.m., we are going to be hosting an event titled Haredim at Technion University in Haifa with David Chivo and Scott Lee Master. It should be really a fascinating, thought-provoking evening. Please join us for that. This evening, it's going to be pretty informal. We're going to start off with some interview questions that Razi and I are going to ask to Tyler. And as we ask our questions, please post your own questions in the chat box to enable a free-flowing conversation. We'll try to get your questions in. If you have any questions for Tyler, uh, just post them and we'll, we'll add them to the discussion, to the conversation. Um, as we ask Tyler questions, we're gonna mix it up a little bit where Tyler might show us a couple of techniques or ideas, workouts, ways that we can keep ourselves safe, healthy, fit at home during this time of craziness with COVID. Finally, before we welcome our guest of honor, as you all know, this time of year has been very, very challenging for many of us. Many in the Jewish community have been struggling due to the challenges associated with coronavirus, and people are struggling financially. We at Chabad believe it is our mission to support our community during these challenging times, and have been doing so on a regular basis, bringing food packages to community members, both Jewish and not. Please consider making a one-time tax-deductible contribution to our Chabad so we can continue to answer yes to those who ask for our help. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome Tyler Davis. I will go ahead and read his bio for us before we get started. I'm sorry, I'm having, I can't see my, how do I get to my stuff? How do I read this stuff over here? Locking my sight, okay. We will get to the bio in just one moment. Okay, here we go. So Tyler Davis started out on his martial arts journey as a wrestler at the age of 11. During high school, he was introduced to jujitsu, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and boxing. Tyler went on to wrestle at the Division I level at the University of Wyoming. Throughout high school and college, he would trade coaching fighters in wrestling in return for their experience, expertise, I should say, in martial arts. You know, after getting to know Tyler for some time, he was always an entrepreneur, always found a way to make a deal work. Then in 2012, Tyler focused primarily on boxing, kickboxing, and jujitsu, and then competed in MMA in 2013. In 2016, Tyler opened up the first mixed martial arts gym in Jackson with a friend who also wrestled at the Division I level. Since then, Tyler competed across the country in jiu-jitsu, and he trains in Muay Thai under Dwayne Ludwig. Please put your hands together for a warm Chabad Jewish Center welcome to Tyler Davis. Thank you. Thank you all of us for joining us. We're going to get started. Um, Razi is going to take the first question away. Razi, go for it. 
So please share with, first of all, great to see you again. I'd love to see you back uh, in the studio very soon. Um, please share with our audience a little bit about yourself, a um, little bit about your background, where did you grow up, and what got you into the world of self-defense? So I'm from uh, Florida originally, grew up there and uh, played baseball, football, basketball growing up. Uh, I was definitely on the smaller side. I was pretty small as an 11 year old sixth grader. And, uh, you know, wasn't quite maybe as competitive in the other sports because of my size. So I was like, well, wrestling has weight classes. I enjoy that and started that and, and had, you know, pretty good success right away and, and got me into that and eventually completely stopped almost every other sport and stuck to uh, wrestling. Awesome. Thank you very much for explaining that background. Um, I definitely can relate to the small side of things. It's, uh, it's why I played basketball, because I was always faster. Okay, so um, you started at 11 years old wrestling, but when did you get into martial arts? Tell us a little bit about that and what type of experience that has been like ever since you got into martial arts. What does that do for you psychologically, emotionally, your confidence? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so I was probably like 16, was a pretty good wrestler, only wrestled, didn't know how to throw a punch, didn't know any submissions, really didn't know any of the self-defense stuff other than straight wrestling. And they had, and I was right outside Orlando is where I'm from, and they had a pro fighter that was, you know, 10 years older than me, that was my size. And they go, hey, this guy's got a pro fight coming up. He's a really good kickboxer, really good at jujitsu. He needs to learn how to wrestle. Can you help him out? So I started, I said, fine, you know, I'll help him out and started wrestling with him. And his wrestling was, was pretty bad. And then by the end, they're going, hey, why don't you do some jujitsu with him? Watch this. So I take him down really easy. And then I get stuck, get caught in some chokehold or something that I'd never seen before. Didn't have a clue what it was. And then afterwards, I'm like, hey, show me that. I, I got to see what that was. I didn't, I didn't know what that was. So then we'd spend, you know, an hour of me teaching him. And then the last 30 minutes, I'd, say, I'd kind of pick his brain and say, hey, show me, show me what, what that was. Show me jujitsu. Show me, you know, again, what, what works in the fights and how to defend what I'm doing. Um, and then also, as I got older, I decided not only that, for my own self-confidence of learning how to do it all. Don't rely on just wrestling. It's, you know, the goal of self-defense is to defend yourself and get away. And wrestling is actually grabbing somebody, being more offensive and getting to somebody. So I started learning um, a lot of striking. Uh, I feel a lot of, again, self-defense getting away from somebody, throwing a punch and exiting, running. Don't go towards the person like you would wrestling. Wrestling is like offense, offense, forward, forward, forward. And um, I think that that, that was a, a big reason to learn the other martial arts of evading, getting away. And it definitely has helped confidence through the roof and everything like walking into a room when for a business or whatever it, it's this weird feeling I, I can't explain but definitely the confidence like I'm good no matter how this turns out I'm good I'm okay it, walking down the street obviously assuming weapons are not involved I'm, I'm completely confident walking down the street not worried about any person that size doesn't matter none of that I, I feel very confident in myself so a cheaper way than um seeing a shrink uh, you know, boost yeah. your self-confidence, boost your uh, personal image and your self-esteem. Yep. Um, so many of us, I'm speaking personally from myself, um, have been cooped up at home uh, during this whole crazy COVID situation and not going to the gym and maybe eating a tad or more than that too much. Um, do you have any tips about how we can maintain a fit lifestyle from the comforts of our home during COVID? Yeah, so I'm definitely not a nutritionist, but I have uh, spent a lot of time cutting weight and losing weight over the last 15 years. Um, so I've learned a lot about it. And, and there's, there's two aspects. There's your output of your working out. And we always focus on that. And we think about, oh, I got to go work out, I got to go work out. But our input is probably as much or, or easier to mess up. And that is even me sitting in quarantine for two months. I'm bored and I just go eat because I'm bored. Um, so the biggest thing there is obviously kind of, I, I do, I count, uh, I count calories to an extent or, or pay attention, obviously staying away from sugars. Everybody kind of to this day and age knows what's healthy and what's unhealthy to an extent, right? We don't want sugar. We don't want cookies and soda and all of that, but also kind of keeping track of my calorie output and input. So if I, if I eat 2000 calories, I need to make sure that my body didn't 
is burning 2000 and not eating four and burning, burning two. Um, so there are, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of shadow boxing and jumping rope and obviously the normal stuff that a lot of people know, push-ups, sit-ups, jumping jacks, all that. But for martial arts specific, um, we, we do a lot of jumping rope. And I think that's a really good one you can really get tired. And there's some drills that we can show you. That's not just stay straight jumping over and over and over. Um, we can, we can do some different stuff there. We can do some shadow boxing. You can obviously do a lot of air squats, stuff like that. So I think, um, whatever keeps you occupied to me personally, I get bored pretty quick, just doing something, uh, simple. Like when, when, when we work out together, just doing jumping rope or just doing the ladder, it gets pretty boring. So obviously as you step up and get more committed to it, you can get a heavy bag and do drills on the bag at home, things like that. There's a lot, I'm sure the, the company standing, uh, selling freestanding bags going through the roof. You can just put them in your living room or whatever. They're filled with water or sand. That's been great. So we can show you um, some, of the, some of the jump rope stuff that we do and we'll, throughout the night, we'll jump back and forth. Uh, but we'll show you some, some shadow boxing and we'll show you some different uh, jumping rope skills that we work on. We, we do them a lot to warm up during class and it's something you can easily do at home. Um, Brian is with me and I'm gonna have him show some and I will, uh, I'll try to move the camera and I will kind of call out what we're working on here. So Brian, if you can jump rope, I'm gonna try to pull this down the best we can here. All right, so just going normal to start. So you've got your normal single jumps here, and then we can work in, you're gonna cro arm cross, so still single jumps, but crossing the arms, go ahead. Also for me, my arms start to cramp up if I'm just doing single jumps over and over. So you can do arm cross a few more, then back to normal. For messing up so we won't feel like fools when we do it too <laughs> yeah he's doing that on purpose maybe he's getting nervous here we can do feet crosses where he's crossing his feet and jumping this one is he's making it look easy this is one of the harder ones for everybody he can do high knees where he's like jogging in place high knees he can do butt kickers where he's moving his feet back towards his butt and then we do some kicking your feet forward this is another one very hard for people to start. You can do single legs, just do a few each leg. And then we can do a double under. So you're gonna jump once and you're gonna swing the rope twice. This is a lot more intense and, and usually after 30 seconds or a minute, you're pretty tired. So just do a couple of them. So he's jumping higher and you can hear the speed of the rope. Getting, you're, gonna, you're gonna spin the rope twice. And then the other thing you can do is simply do all of those and swing the rope backwards. Talk about messing with your brain a little bit rather than focusing on how tired you are jumping rope. So do some backwards, random stuff backwards. Yeah. Hmm. All right, and then just pull the rope down. Do you know typically how many, you know, calories you would be burning in like, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes of jumping rope? You know, I don't, I don't know the exact for jumping a rope. I'm going to guess five minutes is probably going to burn about 80 calories is my guess. Obviously the size of the person and the intensity is going to be a big factor there, but my guess would be about 80 calories for five minutes. And that's the thing. I don't think people realize how hard it is to burn a pound of yeah, fat. That it is a lot seem of enough. work. You're talking 3,500 calories to burn a pound of fat. So if five minutes is only 80 calories, you're going to have a lot of, a lot of jumping rope to truly um, pull off, get a pound of fat off. And now in addition to fat, this is also fitness and health and, and well-being. And it's great training generally for all kinds of forms of self-defense. One of the things that I remember growing up is my grandfather jumping rope. It's one of the few things that I remember about him. Um, he died when I was very young. Um, but he was always into health and fitness and, and he jumped rope quite a bit. Um, it's a great, great, great workout for all kinds of ages. Um, you know, simply jumping rope with no other, because some of those techniques were pretty awesome. I mean, those were pretty fancy stuff, double jumps and crisscrossing the legs. Um, it, for someone who's just getting started with jumping rope, they not, might not be able to, to do it as effectively or as competently, but I would imagine just doing it simply works too. 
For sure. It definitely does. And when I started. You're on mute. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, all right. So I started jump rope at 14. Before wrestling practice, I said 10 minutes every day I'd jump rope. I couldn't get more than a few in a row. I was awful. Um, so yeah, just doing what you can. Mainly the most important thing is to actually continue to move. Don't get caught doing something super hard and messing up every 10 seconds and then taking a 20 second break. So definitely just keeping the rhythm. And then as you get going, what will happen is you'll actually start to get bored after several minutes and then you can start adding one trick at a time. Um, awesome. Now, Gabriella asked, any suggestions on how to develop the discipline to stick to a workout program? Yeah, and that's the absolute hardest thing at home. Um, very hard. I think the best thing for me is to write it down, whether it's writing it down on a piece of paper and post it on my mirror, putting my, I put reminders on my phone, like, hey, it's time to work out, and put, like, another snooze on it. For me, like, writing something down the day before, and even the same thing within the workout. Write the workout down of what your goal is prior to starting. If you just say, I'm going to go work out, and in your mind you have, like, this really hard workout, and slowly that thing just gets cut, 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 cut. So writing it down prior to the workout starting and maybe the day before of a time, schedule it out. This is what I'm doing. Here's my workout. I think that's the best. I mean, obviously having a coach is great. And I think that's where you're like, Hey, I'm meeting my coach at two o'clock tomorrow. You kind of got to show up and then you just show up and do what they say that that makes it so much easier. But yes, oh, yeah. at home is a struggle <laughs> much harder at home. So I would say some, you know, having, discipline is very a very difficult thing to develop you either have it or you don't if you don't have it you got to know what to do on your own end in order to be able to ensure that you have checks and balances in place yeah. writing down reminders to yourself that's a check and balance having a mentor or someone that keeps an eye on you a trainer a coach someone who you're going to those are all great ways to make sure that you're doing it having a spouse doing it together with them so you're scheduling it together those are all great, great ideas. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, this has got to be uh, the first time you received this question. Tyler, you're not Jewish. You have trained intensely with a variety of martial arts, but for some reason, jujitsu is where you compete and what you're most passionate about. Is it about the Jew in jujitsu or is there something else about this martial art that you love? Well, well it's pretty, pretty funny on top of that about jujitsu is I hated it when I started. I absolutely didn't like it, couldn't stand it. I, you know, you watch like the UFC, the high level uh, MMA, the top guys in the world. I watched it, I wrestled, I rooted for the wrestlers. And what made me like it so much and fall in love with it was that simply it works. That was it, you know, there, it's, a, it's a fact that if you watch a fight, wrestler takes this guy down or whatever, he gets a submission and the jujitsu guy wins. And it really came down to not a matter if I like it or whatever is this stuff works. I need to learn it. If I'm, if I want to be the best fighter, best self-defense possible thing I can do for myself, I got to do what works and what works is jujitsu. And, and it is great. And that's what made me do it. And I, I ran from it for a long time. And then every time I go work out with these fighters, why do you hate it? I, I, I didn't like the mentality like earlier, like, people that wrestle the wrestling mentality is like forward 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 offense go 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 jujitsu is more of a they call it the gentle art and you're like sitting back it's a little it is a little more it's a slower paced um competition it is a more of a chess game right like just slower in general like i'm gonna wait see what you do you see what i do so in a lot of these fights you'll see somebody like a wrestler be really offensive really aggressive come out take him down beat him up for a little bit and the jujitsu guy's like really calm and hanging out and just defending and blocking stuff and then eventually the other guy makes a mistake and then boom it's over he gets a submission and that's why it's so good for self-defense like if you're getting attacked and you can stay calm mentally defend 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 the person makes a mistake here's a submission whether it's a choke or, or some type of joint lock or something or it's a boom you made a mistake i reverse the position i get away and i'm gone so it really came down to it works even though it was the opposite like my mentality is very offensive like go 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 attack go from the sports aspect and this jujitsu thing kept run, kept becoming a problem for for other wrestlers and MMA events, and I was like, I, I better learn this. And then the more I got into it, the more I liked about it. And there's so much to so much to learn. Again, like a chess game, there's counter after counter after counter, and then it's like an infinite learning. As soon as you think you got it, 
somebody invents something else and then you have to go relearn all the new stuff they just figured out. Wow, sounds complex. Um, so a question from me, am I? Um, about a month ago, I had a back injury, sciatic shift, and had, had a fair amount of pain. I had a great physical therapist and I'm doing much better. During this time, I can only stand up or lie down. I've not been able to sit. Yesterday, I had my first session with my personal trainer since the injury and we did core work. Are there gentle exercises to strengthen my legs as they become very tired when I stand a good part of the day? Well, as about halfway through, I kept thinking core work and it looks like you're doing that. I, I mean, I definitely, um, I think core is gonna be the biggest thing for sure. And I know the legs will, will come second, but the legs being the strongest part of your body, I think the, the legs will, will come quicker. Um, but other real specific in that scenario, I, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> with such a, such a major injury, given too much advice there. Um, I know some friends and my dad's had back surgery and it is a, it's a tough one. Um, but I know everybody that I know has been done tons of core and got their core so strong before they even move on to the legs. So I, I am not sure past that. Awesome. So the question is coming in from Facebook. Uh, Yuri Davis is asking, what is your favorite way to recover following a match or your workout? Um, so trying to get, you know, something I did, especially when I was competing, like not as much from a um, hobbies aspect, but straight like, hey, I'm in college and this is, this is super high level. I did drink Pedialyte a lot, especially after weigh-ins or matches to get electrolytes back in me rather than just straight water. I used to do Gatorade and then you start to learn staying away from some of the sugar and Gatorade. So I did a lot of Pedialyte um, and trying to get um, carbs into me quickly. Um, if it's just, and now that's assuming I have a match and I have another one coming up. Um, after workouts, they had me taking a lot of protein shakes um, along with Pedialyte to rehydrate, things like that. Awesome. Let's do some more uh, demonstration of workouts that we can, we can bring into our own homes. Okay. Um, what about some shadow boxing uh, okay. as a great workout just for keeping safe, our self-defense, the world's gone crazy out there, all kinds of weirdos on the streets. You want to make sure you're staying safe. So give us some good techniques that we can do in our homes that are pretty simple. They're great for our health and great for our self-defense. Okay. So let me see. Let me know if I'm too far, too close. So just when you're throwing a punch, I'm going to stay closer for now. When you're throwing a punch, Always keeping your hands up, even if we're shadow boxing or whatever. If you're gonna do it for self-defense, you might as well do it right. So our hands are up for our protection. When we throw our jab or our cross, it is going completely straight. We are turning it over, knuckles are over here. A lot of people just do this, and almost like you're pushing. I rotate and twist my hands. The last thing, I'm kind of snapping and turning it over. So my jab will be my lead hand. I am right-handed, so my right hand is my power hand back here. My shoulder is gonna be forward. I'm gonna be left leg forward. My jab is my, my, my Come on, almost my setup hand or whatever it may be. This is the one you're gonna throw the most. So notice my elbow stays in, I'm not doing this. This is kind of normal for people. So I'm staying with the jab, and I'm rotating my shoulders. You can see my left shoulder coming forward. And then my cross is my right strong dominant hand. I'm rotating all the way over. It is all your, just like almost any sport. Your power is in your, your hips and your shoulders and your body, your core. Not, I'm not gonna punch or hurt anybody like this, so I'm extending, extending. It will create more, more force, more energy, and it will burn more energy from a workout perspective rather than just doing this. So those are your straight punches. Your hook is I'm twisting my body. These are probably the hardest, I think, for everyone when they're learning. So I've got my jab, I turn it over, my cross, turning with my hook. You've got your lead hook and your rear hook, and then you've got your uppercuts. Same thing, you're using your, your hips coming up, Palm is facing you on your uppercuts. So I've got my lead uppercut, which is my, my left side, depending on your stance, and then my rear um, coming there. So I'm actually gonna back up. You can have, me and Brian can both do it. Maybe we can both kind of stay in frame here. So we do it together here. So we're moving, throwing punches. Always making sure you're breathing. Most people will hold their breath for 10 seconds and then they're too tired. Another thing, making sure I'm bringing my punches back to my, my face. I don't want to do this like I'm pawing at something 
and my hands are coming down. If it's a real fight, I'm gonna get hit in the face. So I'm trying to throw everything. Every punch, I'm protecting my face. Everything is offense and defense the whole time here. So you can also throw a knee forward, rotating my hip forward, and you can throw ground kicks coming around here. Um, I don't know if that, was that, it, does that angle all right? It's kind of hard yeah. to get in and out there. Um, so, punches, so straight punches, round punches, uppercuts, knees, you got your front kicks as well. It's a really good one and I can demonstrate with Brian maybe. So if somebody's attacking me, I can front kick and push them away. So as they're coming to me, push, push. And they can throw a knee, shake knee here. But notice my hands are up. I want to always protect myself. Even if we're drilling, the round kick will come at an angle from the side. I'll throw kick here. Coming around, or the other side, there. So you got front or round to the kicks. My punches, I got straight punches. Go close. Round punches here and uppercuts. Definitely more fun to train with someone than when you're just doing it alone. Yes, it's great to have somebody hold pads for you. It's a lot of fun. You can throw full speed, full power, or the same thing um, on a bag. If you if you can hang a bag, we've got hanging bags, we've got freestanding bags um, that you can get online or something like that as well. And, and Tyler's an awesome, awesome trainer, coach to hang out with. He's fun, always changing up the regimen, always learning new things, going back to the basics, going back to the things that you've learned in the past, but always upgrading and getting better, critiquing when necessary and improving our skills over and over and over again each and every time we come. It's been too long since we've seen you, but we'll get back to you as soon as things, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Um, are you guys open, I mean, for one-on-ones, if someone would like to book a training session with you now to start some, uh, it's a great workout and it's also a great, uh, great for your self-esteem, great for your self-defense. So it has many, many things that are coming together. It's not just going on a bike ride or sitting in a gym and lifting weights. It's much more than that, at least from my perspective. I really enjoy it. Um, are you doing personal training sessions these days? Yeah, we are. It's a little different than normal. Um, our class, we do have regular classes as well, but the classes are completely different. Everybody's got their own bag. Everybody's more than six feet apart. Um, we are doing one-on-one -on -one sessions. We are trying to stay a little bit more distant than normal, but we are doing them. One-on-ones are allowed. Um, so we are able to do them. It's great to do it. Um, and like we said, it's, it's just fun to have somebody hold the pads. I think, and obviously I'm biased, I just like it so much because the outside world goes away for an hour because I am focused on something else rather than, oh, I'm running and I'm running when I'm running, all I'm thinking about is everything else going on or lifting weights. So I get focused on whether it's, it's, it's some sparring session. Somebody's trying to submit me, hit me, punch me, all that stuff. So I have to react mentally. Or there's a coach saying, three kick, two kick, return, plant, follow, adding all the different stuff. So I'm so focused on doing the actual drills that I don't have time to think about the stress of real life for an hour. And that's what I, I like so much about it. Razy and I are, are guilty of not always being that way because we switch off. So the two minutes that Razy's on, I'm on my phone. And two minutes that I'm on, Razy's on her phone. But we don't have to talk about our neurosis. Two that time then. We don't have to publicly acknowledge our neurosis. I think you just did. Oh, whoops. Okay. Uh, Raze, you want to ask the okay, next so, question? Okay, um, so you own your MMA gym and business, and you're an entrepreneur and involved in real estate. Is there any connection between martial arts, self-defense, and business? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as everybody knows, I mean, everything's so relative mentally, how we, how we handle things. So we have the gym, we have a landscape company, we have a property management company, we have developments. So we have all of these things, and it's all the same, overcoming adversity day to day. You're going to get some crazy things going to pop up and you're going to have to figure out how to get over it. And it's great. And that happens to me my whole life. Like somebody in practice keeps hitting me in a move for two weeks and I can't figure it out. 
And I keep going back to the drawing board and figuring out how do I crack the code? What do I, how do I get over this? What do I do? And it's the same thing with any of the businesses that we, that we do is, is we're running into a problem. How do we get around it? Even right now with, with, with COVID. All right. How do we, how do we survive? How do we pivot? What can we do? What do we change? How do we still run a class or, or, you know, what can we do there? So it's great. And the confidence, they go hand in hand there because I'm so used to doing it my whole life, overcoming adversity and especially martial arts where it's a one-on-one -on -one sport. Like you go compete, whether it's wrestling, jujitsu or MMA, you are on your own. You can't, it's too late for excuses to blame the coach or blame your teammate or the referee. It's on you and, and you're going to be exposed if you didn't prepare. And uh, so I've learned to the discipline on, on that aspect of like cutting weight is something I mentioned earlier. Like, Probably the heart that is what separates these sports from every other sport is the fact that you're going 24 seven, you leave, you know, when I play football, you leave football practice at six o'clock, you go do whatever you want to do. And it does not matter. It does not affect football practice the next day to an extent where, Oh, I literally drank too much Gatorade tonight. Now my weight's too high. I drink too much water because weigh-ins are tomorrow. I mean, those are huge problems or I just went, I, I went out, you know, you're 14 years old, 15 years old. Oh, I went and ate pizza. Uh Oh, I forgot I got to weigh in tomorrow. So I can't do those things. So the discipline of these carry over to where like an entrepreneur obviously is never like truly off work. You can get a phone call at seven o'clock. So you, those same mentalities, I think carry over. It's the absolute best background in my opinion for an entrepreneur that's trying to run a business. Awesome. I love that. That sounds uh, truly, um, it, it sounds real. It sounds true. It just rings to be, to be in my mind true. When you have to uh, push forward and have discipline, uh, that benefits every other area of your life. Um, okay, question from Adam Gostel. Any recommendations for holding the pads? He finds it a lot easier to throw punches than to hold the pads himself. Well, I'm shocked to hear that, Adam. You find it easier to punch, huh? Okay, it is hope you're not trying to hold the pads for your own punches. <laughs> it is, he, he is a hundred percent right. It is hard. It is its own skill. So when you are starting to hold, whether the puncher is, is great or not, you definitely need to go slow because the person holding is setting the tempo. Um, the biggest thing I've noticed from the smaller, like focus pads for boxing is don't just hold them out here. It's natural for somebody to hit them. Like, hold them in. I can grab some real quick. Give me one second. So a couple basics that are, are really good is try not. So these are it, right? You see the target. You're like, hit it. So hold them in. Say whatever combo, whatever you're going to do, and then say go. And then put one at a time, and you hold the combo. The other thing that I see a lot is – your, your depth on, on the video is not going to be very good, but they'll hold them like this. Or one's really close, and one's like two feet behind, and your arms are the same length, basically. So one's going to be too close, or one's going to be too far. They're not going to be even. Or they'll hold across here and a hook like way out here. So in theory, you're, you're practicing punching somebody in the face. So they need to be kind of close here. So I want my uppercuts in the same kind of spot as my cross or my hooks. This is my area. I don't want to be uppercuts up here, jab down here. And that is pretty common. Or the other thing will happen is they, as they punch, they like jam them too much. So you're trying to find, we are just moving just enough to catch it. Um, and that's boxing. The kicks are even harder. Kicks, are, I don't think people realize how much it may hurt when you're holding those big tie pads. It looks like, oh, there's this big, thick thing. It will blast through you. And even whenever we have our like 250 pound giant guys in here kick i only use certain pads because they're thick enough the little ones just will, will hurt my arms so much when you are holding a uh and i'll hold for some kicks and i know i've worked with adam with uh one of my coaches chris and he's a big guy and that that helps him hold but you almost want to hold like a triangle like this and at about a 45 degree angle you don't want to be out here for kicks because what's going to happen it's going to fly back and hit you so you want to bring your elbows in and be out of 45. You don't want them upright because what will happen is the kick will slide up sometimes and you don't want them out and you don't want it to slide underneath and hit you in the body. In a, in a perfect scenario, you have a body protector and this when somebody's really kicking hard, but I can kind of show you here. So go to the left. So I am going to keep my elbows in and as he kicks, I can barely 
barely lean into it. The right side in here. So I've got, I've got a triangle here to make a bigger space rather than stack one next to it. Wide and out, and I'm just barely pushing here. The angle of this is super important. Here, it can come over the top and kick you in the face. Here, it can go underneath and hit you in the ribs. So it is a lot of practice. I was just talking to a, a personal trainer today that they said, oh, I want to send some clients over. I don't know how to hold pads. And I was like, you know, you definitely, it is a skill and you should just hold with somebody. So my wife and I, during our quarantine, we did that where I hold and she holds. But when she's holding, there's a, there's a, there's a learning curve that you have to go super slow on my side. So I don't, she doesn't miss, a, miss holding a kick and I kick her in the face on accident. Because at the last second, when you have this much room to stop, it's too late. So you definitely got to control everything. It, it is pretty hard. Wow. Now, as Adam's um, last thing, I've, uh, I've kicked Chris in some bad spots, probably more than anybody when I started. Because so, I was kicking too hard. Too I think hard. it was once that Zalman uh, had you on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a bad mistake. And razy has got a pretty nasty roundhouse kick herself. I'm yeah. sure Tyler's arms are very tired after Razy kicks. No, no, he just makes sure to wear full body. It is a workout holding these things. These things are probably like five pounds each. And you're holding two of them and moving and absorbing punches and kicks the whole time. It is its own workout to an extent. Well, now we know that Jackson, thank God, is pretty safe. But um, not everyone on here is from Jackson. Um, some of these places are getting pretty wild. Can you demonstrate what would be your best self-defense move? So in general, and we had this, we had jujitsu class tonight and, and, you know, especially with COVID now, we're not able to like drill the moves as much. And we've taken part of class like, hey, let's talk through scenarios. Think of some type of self-defense scenario and me and the other coach will touch and we, we will go over it and everybody else can watch. And I think you can learn a lot there. And, and it always comes back to if you are within, it's ironic that we're talking six feet on everything, but if you are within six feet, 10 feet of somebody, you always want to be looking at them and facing them. Think about boxing, like whether you're punching or pushing away. I can't box with you if you're behind me. I can't stop you from choking me, from grabbing me, from lifting me in the air. So always, always facing the person, no matter what the scenario. Now, if you start to get 10 feet away, then turn. And, you're saying and don't turn your back and like run like... Not until you're too far away. So like, let's see here. So if Brian is right here, and I'm like this, like, oh, I'm gonna try to get away. Brian's gonna jump on my back and choke me. So go ahead and just do the next choke. Like this, and then I'm stuck. So I need to push, get away, get away, and then when I get a good enough distance, then it's time to run away. You don't wanna run away too early and they just grab you. So I would push away or back away, and if they stay, set a boundary, like, hey, don't come any closer push and I don't turn my back until I'm a good distance away, then I can run. So that's the biggest thing. If you have a specific, maybe, you know, something specific, maybe we can ask people of, of a self-defense scenario. Um, we, we've done several self-defense classes and some of the ones that everybody is so worried about are the easiest to defend. And the ones that like, oh, that's no big deal are usually the hardest ones to defend. So one we talked about earlier today was the, uh, somebody just like grabbing you and pushing you up against the wall to choke you. To me, easiest one to defend. And the reason is, so we'll, we'll imagine that there's a wall behind me. Just here, here, friend. If he goes to grab me by the throat, my hands are open. I can punch, I can kick, I can knee, I can poke him in the eyes. These are pretty easy to, to defend yourself. What is really hard is when the person just shoves you up against the wall and they're hugging you. That's actually a whole lot harder to get away from but like the, the choke there, the person is, their thing about we were saying boxing, like I've got one hand out punching, one hand defending. One hand out, one defending. If you go like this, there's no defense for me. As long as your arm, my arms are longer or just as long as the person that's choking me. Because Correct. if he's standing in a choke and I can't reach his face. The good thing is your feet, your legs are probably going to be longer. And then you start to kick. And I think that's you kick up the middle, you kick around. That is, that is kind of the alternative. Rarely, even somebody that's much shorter, are their legs gonna be shorter than the person's arms? That is most likely. But what you can do is I can attack at his elbows, is I can chop down on one elbow and push up on the other and circle away. And I can break that lock and I go away like this. 
and then I scoot away and run. So those are your, your go-tos. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think I make some people mad. There is, a, there is a point where a seven foot person grabbing somebody four feet tall is going to be a big problem. There is a size problem for sure always. Even with me, if I go with somebody just as skilled as me and they're 100 pounds bigger, I've got a, a huge problem there. Um, so, I mean, that's the point of jujitsu trains you to close that gap, but two people being equally skilled, the bigger person is going to win. So now my other question for you is, typically, you know, when you see people fighting, one person has like an arm out and they're using the other arm to whack you, you know? They sort of like, you have one arm out, it's the typical stance, and the other arm is sitting there and they're, they're, they have a stick or they have a shoe or they have something in their hand and they're whacking you with that or their fist. What's the strategy for that? I think that's the most common thing that I would see in a street type fight. It's usually not two people standing up like this and boxing at each other. It's usually people slapping at each other, one person with one hand out, and usually, so. What yeah, that's right. and what it is, is it's, it's, it's two people unskilled in, in combat is really what it is. Because if you see two pros all of a sudden, which never happened, all of a sudden in a street fight, they're gonna be like this, they're gonna be moving and throwing, and they're gonna be more defense. What it is, is that person is either grabbing something, like if you've seen hockey, and they just grab and just hit each other. Um, is it's almost a measuring stick, right? If, if, if I can touch him like this, that means I can punch him. So if it's like this, I'm way away, I'm not gonna punch, now I can touch him, now I can punch. So that's a big thing. The worst thing, and I tell people this, that forget self-defense, people that are actually trying to learn to fight. Like, hey, I'm gonna go compete in boxing or kickboxing. If you're at the end of the punch, just stick your hand out, and I'm at the end, and I back up, and I stay in this range, I'm just gonna continue to get hit and hit and hit. So you need to make a drastic change in distance. Get drastically away, or if you are skilled in jujitsu or whatever, drastically closer, and you close that distance. If I, if he's there, and he's got this hand out, right, and he's trying to grab me, he's punching me with that hand. If I can clear this hand and get close to him like this, right now I can't get punched. My head is hidden behind his shoulder, and then I can get really close and control. So we had a, um, a cop in. a lot of guts for, you know, let's say a woman is uh, getting sure. beaten up by a man to try and even imagine uh, grabbing him and putting your head in. That's, that's I think, more guts than. Uh... Oh, for sure. It is not, and it, it, it's even for guys. And I think guys act as if they would do that. But in all reality, if you haven't trained it, if you haven't spent, you know, hours upon hours upon hours uh, regardless of your sex, you were probably not going to do that. And that's what I mean, where it comes for years of training, you can do that. So we had um, a highway patrol uh, officer in earlier, and we were talking about this. Obviously, that's a big thing going on right now is um, excessive force. And we were talking through some scenarios, and I see he actually asked kind of that question. What do you want to do? And I'm like, well, if you're trying to arrest somebody, obviously, you don't want to run away from the guy, but you also don't need to pull out a weapon. So it was getting to them. And if somebody's trying to hit me and I can get to them and close them, like Adam said earlier, and like wait for my opening and then get, get a, a higher ground in, in position, I can do that. But yes, if, if it's truly like get away, don't stay at the end of those punches or the stick or whatever that is. Make a drastic uh, getting away from a distance uh, scenario and then run. I think what happens is, we go like, our mind goes away and you're getting hit and you're getting hit. So you almost like just ball up and stay. And that's the worst. You're at the end of that distance. So you need to make a drastic, I got to run. I got to get away. And if they're grabbing you, you need to break that grip. However, they're grabbing you, grab it, push it, and then run away. The worst thing in the world is staying at the end of that punch or the end of the stick or whatever that is. If you're at the end of the distance and you slowly move away, they just slowly follow you and you're always at that distance. So you need to get drastically away or drastically inside. But yes, if you have not trained it, almost no one is going to close that distance and deal with them. Awesome. Um, if there was one mantra or one idea in your head that has contributed the, for your own confidence, for your own self-defense, for your own competitions. What is that one idea that you keep at the back of your mind at all times says, I am going to, going to win. I am going to be safe. I'm going to 
what's that idea in the back of your mind? It, it's really simple. It's like what you're told at like five years old, the first sport I ever did is just don't quit. And I, I think again, from jujitsu, wrestling, kickboxing, MMA fights, or business, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how stressed it gets, I know I am not going to quit. I'm going to keep trying. I'm not going to quit. And as soon as I tell myself that, stress goes away, life becomes easier. Whether the scenario got easier or not, as soon as I tell myself, I'm not going to quit, done. Make that decision. I move forward and it, it, it makes it a whole lot easier. And I know that it's almost probably too simple, but that's how I, I operate uh, in my own head. What about the mantra of the person who's in self-defense trying to defend themselves what are they trying to tell themselves i think it is the same thing you're not going to quit you know you got to you know at some point learn that there is um learn that what is your alternative in that scenario right you do need to learn and everybody and it does not matter size sex age everybody should learn some self-defense i think and, and absolutely in case that scenario happens it's like getting insurance on your house, right? You don't think it's going to burn down, but just in case, I better go get some insurance. I think it's the same scenario. I think everybody should be skilled in, in some self-defense. And it's not, a, it's not a, oh, I show up on a Saturday in self-defense class. You forget all of it by the next day. It's a constant, like, like you would go to school. It's, it's a constant, always evolving thing. And it takes years to, to build the, the skills and the confidence to, to, to control that situation. But yes, in that situation, it is fight or flight kind of thing. You, you have to fight back. You can't quit. That's, that's not an option. So I'm going to go back to your last thing that you said before of the self-defense and the, I'm going to go there, and the, um, you know, your, your legs are going to be um, further than their arms. Then you ended off and you were talking about if they have a stick. So if somebody has a stick, then what's your mode? Uh, you know, somebody has a weapon, so not a, not a gun, but something that's longer and further, your feet might not reach, your arms might not reach. How do you, um, how do you deal with that? It is obviously infinitely harder if they have a bat or a stick or something like that. But the, the concepts are still the same. You're trying to, I think then that's when you need to be skilled and close the distance. I've seen videos where somebody has a baseball bat. And as they swing it, I step in and baseball bats voided out here. That's, that's not, you can't hit somebody when they hug you. But again, only that will only happen if you're skilled enough to step in, grab them, take them down, control them, hold them, yell for help until somebody comes, whatever that scenario may come. But yes, it, it does make it harder, but it is the same concept. I need to get way away from that stick or get to the stick and get my hands on him or or on the stick itself. I would prefer to get so close and grab them that they can't actually, it's almost too big that they can't hit you. Um, I did see Adam's question. He's got a, a point on the arm bar. In practice, different if scenario. You explain his question for those of so, us. Oh yeah, so in practice, say we are, we are doing sparring in practice and it's called an arm bar and it will, it will take your elbow this direction and it will hyperextend your elbow. Obviously will cause tons of, of damage. In practice, I will tap early. I am not going to get hurt in practice. I'm not going to waste a surgery or a lifelong elbow injury or any of those. So in jujitsu, you can attack the ankle. There's submissions to break the ankle, the knee, tear the ACL, the hip, shoulder, there's shoulder locks, there's elbow locks, wrist locks, and neck cranks. So like every joint, there's a move that can, that can hurt it or destroy it or rip it. And in practice, yes, you need to tap early. Like in jujitsu, they say tap early, tap often when you're learning because there's no point in hurting yourself in practice. But there is the same mentality of, all right, you arm barred me again. I'm not, hey, let's go again. You arm barred me again. Let's go again. On Thursday at the next class, let's go again. And I say that as in the not quitting. I'm not going to say, oh, I got arm barred at practice tonight. I quit jujitsu. I'm done. So I think the mentality is, yes, you have to tap. So you, you tap out and let the partner know, like, hey, you got me. You win. Let's reset. And that's kind of the beauty of jujitsu is that you can go full speed, full power, and there's enough respect between the partners. As, as soon as I tap twice or you tap twice, we completely stop immediately so we don't hurt anybody. So you will go to the, the point of somebody getting choked unconscious, they tap, or their arm is about to break, they tap. So in practice, tap a lot. Don't be stubborn and get yourself hurt. But I say again, don't quit as in, you can do it to me a thousand times. I'm coming back 
one more time to see if I can stop it or see if I can beat you. And that's that mentality of no matter what happens to me today in practice, I'm going to show up to next practice. And I'll show up more than that guy. And he might beat me for a year, two years, five years, but eventually I'm going to catch him. I'm going to beat him. And that was that mentality for the, for the practice aspect of it. Okay, Ray, you want to ask the last final question? Could you show us a final cool self-defense techniques that we could practice at home? And then afterwards, if people have their own questions, continue to type them in or we're going to open up the mics and people can ask questions directly to Tyler. But one final uh, self-defense technique is what Ray's I'll show a couple uh, random, and I know Adam knows a lot about it, so maybe, Adam, you can throw some stuff in or, or scenarios that I'm forgetting. Um, there are, there are a couple, I'm going to show as long as Brian's okay, I don't want to ruin his t-shirt, but there's a t-shirt choke that um, is pretty cool. And it, it is, it is like a last ditch. You're in a really bad spot. You can actually choke somebody with their own t-shirt. Um, and so I'll show a couple. I might have to move the camera around depending for some of these. So I'm going to assume I fell down, this person's attacking me and he's upright like this, he's standing, right? So what I don't want to do is to have this be sitting up and this person kicks me or punches me in the face, right? So I don't want that. So I'm actually gonna lay, let me move this real quick. So I'm gonna lay on the ground and keep my feet up. So I'm always facing him and my feet are in front between our bodies. I need to protect my head and my body. If he kicks or punches me in the leg, it's not the end of the world. So my feet are up like this. If the person comes to me, I'm gonna put my feet in their hips and I'm gonna grab both of their feet if I can. Now, at this point, he probably can just barely get to my face and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my feet, grab. So think about tripping somebody. You need something from behind. I've got something behind. I got two feet to push. I push him. As he falls, I use his feet as my anchors and I pull myself up. So he can do the same thing. As I get, freeze real quick, I just can't reach his nose, and he pushes and pulls, and then he stands up. So that's a very easy one that we work in class to start. Um, another one that I think is super easy, and, and we start our, our self-defense classes, if somebody grabs my wrist like this, always, always, always go towards their thumb. So his thumb is on top right now. I'm gonna take my thumb and I'm just gonna go into him. Notice my elbow will go forward like that. What happens a lot is they pull. So you pull me and I'm pulling and I'm stuck and I can't get away and that's the natural thing to do. I actually need to go into the grip like that and he will lose his grip. If his thumb is down, so his, his four fingers are up, thumb is down, I cut down like I'm just karate chopping down. Worst thing to do is to just pull back. That's the natural thing is to pull, pull, pull. And you're gonna get pulled back into him, especially if the person's bigger. So attack the thumb like that. If he grabs both his hands on my hand, same concept. It's gonna be like this. And if I'm smaller, I'm gonna get pulled away wherever, pulled down something. So I'm gonna grab my hands together. So two hands versus one right now, I lose this battle. I go two hands to two hands, same thing. I go forward with my elbow and lift. And then now, if, you're, if you're not as strong as the person who's grabbing you, can you still get out of a grab with that technique? Yes, you can. It will take a little bit more. You, you're, the, the smaller the person, the more perfect the technique. But, and, and I would recommend try this with somebody right now or afterwards, grab somebody and say, hey, grab my wrist and hold on as tight as you can. I need, if you pull back, you will not get away. I need to take my elbow and go forward and my hand up like this. That right there, and if Brian can hold as tight as he possibly can, I go up like this. You should not be able to hold it. I mean, it'd be pretty surprising if, if, if somebody could hold you there. So afterwards, you two try it, you're up. Somebody get a partner and try that. That one's really easy. And that's the one that a lot of people are really worried about, like walking down the, the street, somebody grabs you, like pulls you inside or does something like that. As soon as somebody grabs me, I'm out like that pretty quick. And again, you just have to drill it until it's natural. If you're like, oh, what was that thing we learned in self defense class? I can't remember. And three seconds later, you're getting drugged on the sidewalk. And I just do this and it's gone. The other thing you can do is you can roll your hand out towards the thumb. That's like a common one as well. You're always going towards them. If I go against the thumb, I'm stuck. Like I'm, I, I, you're definitely not getting away. Go towards the thumb and I can re-grab his wrist or I come up. But my elbow has to go in like that rather than pulling. Pulling won't work. 
Um, anything else? Um, Adams mentioned a triangle choke. I can show you real quick. Um, he, he's right. In theory, you're going to be in a bad position. So we'll do a triangle choke, then we'll do a t-shirt choke. And this is like you are completely on your back. The person is on top of you. You've got your legs wrapped around them, but this is, this is two chokes that you can get out. And it will absolutely, the, the video won't do it justice, will absolutely put the person to sleep. So come here real quick. So we're here, person's on top of me. I've got my hands, I'm covering up like this. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm hey, gonna grab- back a little bit from the video so we could see a little better. So right here, good? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna pull his shirt so it doesn't rip like this. The whole thing, so I got a good grip. I'm gonna grab it across like this. I'm gonna pull him down. So my palm is in right now. I'm gonna take my thumb and my thumb goes in and I get my grip like this. So I've got both hands behind his back. I'm gonna pull him and swing my arm over like this. And it's called a, it's, if there's multiple different ways of variation, but it's basically a cross choke. And I pull and squeeze him in and see how he taps there. He would probably within 10 seconds go unconscious here from squeezing. So that's a, a collar choke. If the t-shirt didn't rip, you could just grab it and grab it like this and squeeze. And the choke will be from his own shirt and I'm pulling across this way. So my hands are crossed, right? So a triangle choke that I was talking about. You're lying on, uh, how did you get down to the floor and how did he get into that position on top? So Jeff, he's, he's thrown me to the ground, right? So he, right. he pushes me, he stands up. This is a common way when two non-skilled persons, or I'd have to be somewhat skilled to do the move, but this person is just an attacker. Doesn't I fall on my back, my feet are like this. They try to come and punch me. I grab their hands, I pull them into me. I, I hug them like this. He can't, so I was saying earlier, close the distance. Right now, he can't punch me in the face. He's too close. So I would be like this, and I would hug him and hug his head. Now from this position, I just squeeze with my legs, squeeze with my hands, and then I can yell for help. He can't really do much and I can squeeze him. And then as I'm doing this, I can grab his shirt, grab the grip, cross my hands here. And he's gonna sit up to try to hit me. And when he does, it gives me space to get to choke him. So that's what I was saying earlier, like jujitsu, like I'm gonna wait until he gives me something. I'm gonna hang out here. So the other scenario is I'm on my back here. I'm gonna try to get one of his arms out and one of his arms inside my leg. And I go like this. So this is a triangle, my legs are triangled. I bring his arm across and I'm going to squeeze across his neck with my legs and pull down with my hands like that. Same thing, very common jujitsu um, choke, but is very uncommon for the normal person that has never done jujitsu. It is going to look very weird. Right now, he was sort of just allowing you to do whatever you wanted to him. He, if he's your attacker, he's going to be attacking you and not just sort of waiting for you yep. to... It's gonna look a lot more complicated. He's, he's tried a thousand times in practice and I can still get him. <laughs> but I've been doing it for years and years and years. Um, but that's what it comes down to. It comes down to like, who's better at math? Probably the kid that's been going to math class more than the other, you know, and that's kind of what this comes down to. So yes, I, I would prop, what I will do with Brian, if I'm in that position, I'm on my back, I will go through a sequence of like five different moves over and over and over and one opens up the other until he eventually makes a mistake and then boom. Or I hold him until he gets frustrated and tries to put his hand in the wrong spot to get away. Like Adam mentioned earlier, like waiting for the openings. I hug and wait, block everything until he over, over uh, throws a punch or pushes in the wrong spot. I'm like, oh, you made a mistake, here we go. So it's a sequence of events that I will continue to go through. So if you said, hey, you guys are gonna go, try. Brian, don't get caught in a triangle. He probably won't get caught in a triangle, but he's gonna get caught in something else because he's gonna do everything he can to defend the one move and I do another. Just like sparring, if I keep throwing a jab and you go to block it every time, I'm gonna throw a hook around instead. And it's just like this trick back and forth, cat and mouse game of kind of what it is. So, but I promise if I brought somebody in on the street that's never done jujitsu, triangle would be pretty easy to hit on because they wouldn't even know what's coming. They have no idea what's going on. So there was just a scenario recently in Brooklyn where a girl, a 15-year-old girl, got um, attacked by a, a group of about 12 guys, um, teenagers. They knocked her to the floor. Um, she was black. They were black. This was not a racial um, uh, issue. They were they 
eventually they pulled her phone out of her hands and their shoes off of her feet and walked away with that, leaving her unconscious. Let's just say, you know, you're not just being attacked by one person, but you're being attacked by multiple people. What, what's your strategy? Yeah. I mean, my strategy, we talked about this earlier as well in class and it, it, there is a point of, like I said earlier, 12 people against me, I'm going to lose. Like I, it, they don't, they can be way less skilled than me. There's a, a numbers game that I am in trouble. Um, in those scenarios, I would try not to close the distance in that person, right? Grabbing one person does nothing for me. That just gives free reign to the other 11. So in that position, I'm going to do everything I can to not let them surround me in a circle. Uh, before they, as they are in front of me, trying to go the other way immediately. But yes, that position, if I was there, I, I, I don't know if I could have done a better job. I mean, there's a point there where even me, the highest trained guy in the world with no weapon to defend themselves there, there, there's a problem. But I would try to stay on my feet. I, that's why I started to do boxing is because one of my friends did get in a fight and it was one-on-one -on -one, and then a random outsider came over there and kicked him in the face out of nowhere. And I was like, when there's numbers or there's that case, that, that risk, I don't want to go on the ground. I don't want to be where we just were laying on my back and somebody stomp on my face. So in those scenarios, I want to be able to punch and move, punch and move until I can get away. I absolutely do not want to end up on the ground. I do not want to get in any altercation with one single person. I need to not let them surround me. I need to get away. And a lot of that's awareness, like big cities or whatever, um, you know, not walking around with headphones in the whole time, paying attention to where you are, uh, those kind of things. And, and that was, I, I did see that one. That was awful. And that was a, a, a hard one to get away. And there's a point of no return there that was hard to deal with. Well, Thank you, Tyler, so, so much for taking the time to share with us and for bringing along your friends to help demonstrate. This was very special for our community. We deeply appreciate it. I'd love if you could just share, uh, Gabriella asked the question about follow-up. If you could yep. share how people can get in touch with you, if they have any questions, if they'd like to train with you. Um, it's, it's really uh, cost-efficient to train one-on-one -on -one with Tyler. Razy and I do it. Um, it's one of the greatest joys of my week. Um, every person who upsetted me that week gets the cross and the punch and the kick and the knee. All those things come out while we're training. Uh, I think about this person and that person, this person who hurt me and cut me off in the, in the left lane. They're getting a good punch on the bag, obviously. But um, in any event, uh, how could people get in touch with you? Where can they find out more about the services that you offer? Share, uh, share a plug for yourself. Yeah, so uh, jacksonholemma.com is our website. It does have our class schedule on there. You can email us there. It does talk a little bit about the programs. But like Gabriella said, the moves are too fast. You can't see it one time and get it. Like, none of us. I can't see a move that I've never seen. Like, oh, I got it. So it is good to see it a lot, to drill it a lot, and have that muscle memory where you just react. Uh, but yeah, our website has our email, phone number. Uh, our class schedule, it tell, tells a little bit about our, our program of what we're doing. Of, of We have a gi jiu-jitsu, a no gi jiu-jitsu, our Muay Thai program, our background. Um, Adam mentioned earlier, uh, Dwayne, uh, his nickname is Bang, Dwayne Bang Ludwig. He was a UFC coach of the year, coach the UFC champs, like one of the best striking coaches in the world. So I train under him. So it talks about, um, you know, our, our, our belt system and all that through him. So I go down to Denver a few times a year for that. And um, I go through, I go to Boston for our, I am under Mike Pellegrino in Boston for jiu-jitsu. Um, and a gi, so gi jiu-jitsu is like your formal sport jiu-jitsu. You're wearing almost like what you've seen in karate, if you haven't seen jiu-jitsu, where you can actually grab the person's fabric, grab their pants, grab their gi, use it as a weapon for yourself. Like I was saying, like his shirt was actually a weapon for me to use against him. So in, in gi jiu-jitsu, you are wearing one. Can you grab one real quick? So he'll show you what a gi is. So I can grab his gi, and it, it, it makes it even more complex of all the different moves we can do. So he puts this on, and I can grab the gi and choke him with his gi. I can grab his sleeves. I can wrap this around his head and still choke him. I can do all these different things. So that's gi jiu-jitsu, and that is more the traditional Brazilian jiu-jitsu that you've seen on TV or the internet or any of that. That's like UFC one, Hoist Gracie came out with his gi and used his gi. 
Um, no gi is like you can wear a t-shirt and shorts and you can't grab the, can't grab the clothes. Um, so that is a different skill set. If you, it, it sounds maybe crazy, but when I can grab his shirt and when I can't grab his shirt is different mindset of what I'm going to try to do. Um, so that's the difference. So we have gi classes and no gi classes. I think everybody should do both. Learn them as much as you can. Uh, but that's the difference there. We have, we do have kids classes. We like to start kids at like six years old. Uh, I think it's great to get them in there. We, we, uh, we do, we were doing kids wrestling right now. We were letting the kids do wrestling during the kids, um, middle school and high school programs, but we have kids jujitsu, kids kickboxing. Never is it kick, kids kickboxing, never spar. We don't allow it. We don't, not till they get older and learn a ton. So it's not something we're going to come in and fight by any means. The jujitsu we do, cause there is no striking. There is, you know, hopefully nobody getting hurt again. They tap and then everything is fine there. Uh, but yeah, if anybody wants to come in, check it out and we can go over stuff and maybe I can find some videos to send back to you guys of the, of the couple moves that we did do the choke, the push and the triangle. So three moves there. Um, to, so that was a sweep where I reversed the position where I'm on my back and I use my feet and trip him. So that'd be a sweep. We're sweeping each other. Um, so I can maybe find something we can send that out to everybody. Thank you, Tyler, very much. One last time, your website is? JacksonHoleMMA.com. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together you. and a big debt of gratitude. Thank you for spending your time with us this evening. We greatly appreciate it. And I encourage everyone, please visit jacksonholemma.com. Is it Jackson Hole MMA? Yeah. Jacksonholemma.com and find out how you can get involved in better health, better self-defense, a great lifestyle. Razy and I really appreciate it. We go twice a week when things are normal and hopefully we'll get started with this again. Thank you, Tyler. This was fantastic. Have a Thank wonderful you. night. I was going to say one more plug um, for Tyler that we spoke at the beginning about the fact that he's a business owner and has a love for MMA. And the advantage when those two come together is that Tyler's always on time. Tyler's so respectful. Tyler's, which, you know, not every um, kickboxing teacher that just does it because they love the sport um, has those also professional business-like skills. So um, we highly recommend Tyler and we'll see you next week. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much.